<laughs> Nicholas, what do you reckon? <laughs> what do you reckon about Labor finally seeing some sense and thinking they might ratchet down their uh, ludicrous uh, uh, climate uh, policies? Uh, well, look, I think, Chris, the sad reality is that after another three years of the Morrison government, it's going to be very hard for Labor to achieve by 2030 the targets for emission cuts that it took to the election. So in that period from 2022 to 2030, uh, it is just going to be too much of an ask for uh, Australia to make the uh, adjustments which Labor had hoped Australia could make by the year 2030. Now, now none of this is... Uh, set in stone yet. I think the Labor Party still has its uh, caucus deliberation process to go through. But, uh, look, I, th I think if you look at some of the things being said by Mark Butler and by uh, opposition leader uh, um, Anthony Albanese in recent days, clearly Labor is moving in the direction of adjusting its 2030 targets. But, look, I'm very pleased to see that Labor is sticking strongly by its 2050 targets. That's zero net emissions yeah, by that, 2050. That's because something, that's, something that's, you that's and Scott Morrison will have in common. Yeah, I mean, uh, but I mean, we, sh we shouldn't forget that that still leaves Australia falling well short of uh, many countries which we like to compare ourselves with, you know, like Canada, like Denmark. I mean, don't forget, Denmark's going to no, go I zero don't... net emissions by 2030. I don't think we compare Chris, ourselves so to Denmark, lot... mate. Denmark is, is, is a chock-a-block to the gunnels with the hydroelectricity, and when it runs out... It brings in a bit of nuclear uh, power from France and the like. You know, um, it's not comparable. But uh, I think Scott Morrison will be very pleased, as you say, that Labor is sticking to that 2050 target. Jane, this is the spin we're getting that, you know, oh, three years, has, uh, this three years of a coalition government means Labor can't really stick with their own policies. But what they're doing, of course, is waking up to the electoral liability, if not the economic realities of their policies. Absolutely. Um, maybe some of the listening tours actually being held, Chris. Look, it's... I would really like Labor to get back to the centre, and this is one of the key issues. I heard it loud and clear on talk radio. Uh, you're right to point out 1.3% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions come from Australia. People are awake to this now. We all want to do our bit. I'd like Labor to come back to the centre so that it can be competitive because... I think that's a good thing for our democracy. It's time for them to change their climate policies. The electorate has spoken. Maybe Labor's finally listening, Chris. That's what they got to do, Peter. You've got to listen, right? You know, I think the, that's the, right. The punters are, are right. The punters aren't wrong. I think that's right. The punters are right. And the moment there's any hint that power prices are going to go up or that electricity will be... Um, will be there'll be blackouts in, in, uh, at the height of summer. The moment there's a threat to the economy or to jobs... Labor's support will hemorrhage back to the uh, to to the centre right parties. Yeah, and it's, it's only the People Greens. No, that we can't Greens. change the climate from Australia. Well, People that's know an... that China and India and other countries, for all sorts of good reasons, are racing ahead with their emissions. I think voters know that, but I think voters also have a sense of being responsible for the yeah, environment. Yeah, we ought to do our bit. Do our bit. But I think there's that clearly it's the economy that comes first, and that's what Labor I think is gradually getting to uh, is, is coming to realise. And there was nothing to do with overly complex policies. It was that the electorate rumbled the policies. Let's just have a look at uh, another comment here from Mark Butler this morning where he was talking more broadly about Labor and the lessons it should take from the election result. No, we don't have it. Well, um, what, it, what uh, Mark Butler says was it was a bad election defeat. And, uh, and Nick, you'll be familiar with the rhetoric he's used before. You know, he said that the Morrison government was a, was a Muppet show and, and they got their backside handed to them by Fozzie Bear and Kermit the Frog. And if that happens, then you've got to re-examine policies. Now, he wasn't talking just about climate policy. He was talking about their tax policies and, and, uh, uh, and others. But, but he's right, isn't it? I mean, it's time to have a, a, a really good look at what, at what was a big and open, and let's, and let's be uh, complimentary, an honest policy uh, platform mm. put forward by Labor. Yeah, I mean, I think Mark Butler has spoke very well on this issue today. I mean, Labor did lose the election. They took a very brave policy platform to the people and ultimately it wasn't successful. So in a democracy, that means you reassess your policies and you put forward a new agenda next time. Now, that doesn't mean Labor should dump its values because I think it's, it's values about being the party of giving every person in this country, the opportunity to, to live their best life is, is absolutely...
the right one. But they do have to go back and have a look at their settings and maybe adjust a few things. But, Chris, I do want to pick you up on a point that you made earlier about Australia and our role in, uh, in, glo in tackling climate change on a global level. Because I've heard you make this point before where you say, you know, Australia can't make any meaningful contribution to, uh, to, to global emissions and, and therefore you go on to infer that therefore we should do nothing. Well, I just say that's completely wrong. I mean, there's well, no, a moral we're, we're doing component a lot. to this. Nicholas, we're Australia signed up is a very wealthy country. Just take, country. Just hang on a second, a Nicholas. Nicholas, country. Nicholas, this we is my show. Just, part just and we let should me step up. Just let me get a word in occasionally on my own show. We are already signed up to Paris. We are reducing our emissions by 26 to 28 per cent. That is not nothing. We've all already destroyed our national electricity grid with a 23 per cent renewable energy target. That is not doing nothing. Australia is already doing more than enough. What is, what is indisputable is that there is no other comparable country inflicting as much economic damage on itself to deliver climate policies as, as Australia. Not one. Well, 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 that's not right. I mean, you look at countries like the United Kingdom, look at countries Nothing. like Paid Canada. Nothing. Paid no economic they, price. They Paid no economic price. They are miles ahead of they us. Were they shutting, are miles ahead they of us They were shutting their coal mines down under Margaret Thatcher for other I mean, reasons when Labor and the left were saying it was a disgrace that they were shutting down the coal mines. They've uh, essentially shifted to gas, nuclear and chucked in a bit of wind. It's easy. They've paid no economic price. Neither has Canada, neither has the US. Nobody's paying an economic price like Australia has. You talk about Denmark and New Zealand, countries that have all this uh, hydropower. We'd all have hydropower uh, if we could, uh, but we don't, and, and therefore Australia's paying a very, very high price. What I do want to go on to, though, is the actual climate and how it's operating now. And, Jane, Jane you, you'll be very focused on this, even though it's not as bad in the West at the moment. But this drought in, uh, in Queensland and, and New South Wales has reached the stage where towns are looking at running out of water in November. Now, uh, this feeds into the climate debate because, of course, people want to blame it on climate change. But, of course, we know you get severe droughts in this country periodically and, and that's what we're in at the moment, whether or not to climate change uh, can be factored in. The point is, real people are, feeling really, uh, are facing really dire consequences <coughs> in the here and now. They absolutely are. It was front page of the Daily Telegraph last mm. night, as a matter of fact, Chris. You know, the, the crisis, the, the countdown for some of the towns where they're going to literally run out of water, whether or not they'll truck water in. I thought Michael McCormack was interesting in his address to the Nationals. Um, he talked about that the launching the National Water Grid Authority and the investment in there and talking about... He talked about the many years since it's been, since a dam has been built. I know that Alan Jones has been red hot on this issue. You're going to have to look at infrastructure. But just on people blaming um, everything on climate change, I thought Larissa Waters' intervention during the week on the bushfires in Queensland and blaming the Queensland Premier and the Prime Minister and somehow the Adani coal mine, which isn't even up and running, on the bushfires when we know that those Greens policies have had so much to do with backburning, locking up national parks, um, all those oh. issues. It, that was an absolute disgrace, Chris, that I just thought... It, and what a terrible thing to say in the midst of those people fleeing their homes. Mm. But hopefully um, Michael McCormack getting on the front foot here with the Nationals about building some infrastructure. It, it, what is happening in these towns running out of water is showing us that uh, literally these people have been left high and dry when it comes to the building of dams and infrastructure. They're going to have to work something out because we're not short of water in this country, Chris. We've just got to we get are. it to the parts that need it when they need it. The odd dam would be very useful.